The white picket fence, long a symbol of home ownership, of peaceful, idyllic, mostly suburban living. But today that term is often said with irony, even cynicism. But our focus tonight is what's behind that real or symbolic white picket fence, the single family home. Is the dream of home ownership alive, attainable, and if so, for whom? And if changing lifestyles, the mortgage crisis, foreclosures, and personal debt caused a lot of us to rethink, reprioritize, or even reject this version of the American dream. And on Stay Tuned, you drive the discussion. We bring local experts, journalists, and civic leaders together to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Tweet us your insights on tonight's topic, and you've got a seat at the table. With a few national experts and a panel of community members, this is the show bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. So stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jim Kircher. Casey Nolan is back from Russia, sleeping off the time difference. He will be back next time we're on the air. Joining me to start off this discussion of home ownership, how good it is, how bad it is, is Jim Gallagher, real estate and personal finance uh, reporter for St. Louis Post-Dispatch. We've been talking about a recovery. It's not the worst case scenario anymore. The, the re recession is, we're coming out of that. The, the housing bubble has burst and it's expanding a little bit again now. But there's got to be a good news, bad news aspect to this. We're not back yet, right? Well, if you are a, uh, if you are a home seller, the good news is that sales are coming back. People are buying homes again. In St. Louis County, for instance, sales are up 8% last year. That was despite a rise in mortgage rates. The previous year, they were up 12%. Prices are a, a mixed bag. If you look at CoreLogic, which is a real estate data firm, they say that prices last year rose in the metro area about 5%. If you look at Zillow, which is uh, another number crunching outfit, didn't rise at all. If you look at the third survey, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, somewhere in between. So those sales are coming back. Prices are a mixed bag. But not everywhere sales. Uh, no, not everywhere. Uh, they vary by St. Charles has always been our, our, our uh, sales leader, and it still is. What should we, we, we be looking at? Let's talk about the good sure. news, the bad news. Okay. But what, what, what are things out there that are, are significant, worrisome, something that you're kind of keeping an eye on? Well, I'll give you two worries. Number one is the absence of first-time home buyers. Traditionally, they, they make up about 40% of the market. These are the young people moving into their first houses. Now they're down to about 26% of the market. Nobody knows where they've gone. We don't know whether it, they're scared by interest rates, whether they're frightened by the fall in home prices and simply don't want to buy again, or, or maybe they'll come back this year. We just don't know. Yeah, and that's really the long-term look, and we're going to be talking about a lot of those things. But the, uh, the homeowners who are selling and buying, they're already, is, is, are we talking about people who are already in the market, who are now back in the market? Well, we, we think they are. You know, yeah. certainly a lot of people who, who went through foreclosures are in no position to still buy. Uh, the, the market itself is uh, coming back and, and stronger than it was. Uh, the problems you're facing are higher mortgage rates. The perhaps 1% rise in mortgage rates over the last year has made affordability down about 12%. Uh, where they are now, you can buy 12% less house perhaps than you could have a year ago, and that will restrain the market. One real problem in the market is a lack of sellers, which is really surprising. Are they waiting the for the prices to keep going back up? Is that well, you've got two problems there. Some of them are waiting for prices to go back up, but you have 25% of people with mortgages who are still underwater. They owe more than the house is worth. Therefore, they can't sell, and they're not in the market. Another problem you have is the banks still are reluctant to lend to home builders. So if with the banks won't lend, the builders can't build, therefore you have less inventory. Big picture, I keep reading that the, the, the real estate market, the housing market, not new home construction necessarily, but the housing market, real estate market, a big indicator of the overall economy. Is that true? It, it traditionally is. So you have a slow recovery in price, you have a slow recovery in sales, you have a slow growing economy. 
We got a lot of experts here, but I wanted to ask you this: Is were a lot of the home sales that helped uh, that that show a recovery? People buying homes and turning them into rental property. Yes. Well, you that that gets you into the foreclosure crisis, which right. thank heavens is easing. Right now, there, there's only about 1% of houses in the metro area that are in foreclosure. That it was double and triple that a few years ago. So these houses being moved, being, being foreclosed on, sold by banks to, to investors, to landlords, that is declining. And we're hoping that that will open up uh, more opportunity for first-time buyers. Yeah, we want everybody, the viewers, to get involved. Uh, hashtag stay tuned STL, because I know there are a lot of people out there, both people who are homeowners, maybe wanting to, to make a move, or young people trying to figure out how they're going yes. to make a move. So I'd like to hear those comments. We've got a lot of experts here tonight. But let's take a few minutes just to look back at this um, a little bit of the history of home ownership and where this whole American dream idea came from and where it might be going. Much of our concept of home ownership in the American dream, especially the suburbs, comes from the 1950s post-war world in which many of today's aging baby boomers grew up. It was a beautiful and sunny day and the kids were all excited. This film was made to promote the new suburban town of St. Anne, Missouri, and it portrays a couple leaving their city apartment in search of, well, the narrator makes that clear. They are about to discover the meaning of the great thrill in American life, the owning of your own home. For it wasn't I, I think clearly there's a number of folks who um, don't look at owning a home with a white picket fence in suburbia as their dream anymore for a whole host of reasons. One, being tarnished by, you know, what happened during the foreclosure crisis. Chris Kramer is head of Beyond Housing, which helps people with the legal and financial challenges of buying and staying in their homes. Uh, I think we have another generation or two before the single family home is no longer the American dream per se. But I, I know, you know, uh, the younger generation is not as um, uh, admiring of, I can't wait to get my home in the suburbs and start my family. City of St. Anne, started in 1942 and incorporated in 1948, is strategically located on historic St. Charles Rock Road. This might look like urban sprawl, but it wasn't really. When Charles Vaderot started building these houses in the 1940s, there was population growth in the metro area and a housing shortage in the city. And while the GI Bill did offer veterans low-cost mortgages, there's more to it than that. To the north and west is the airport industrial area, which employs over 30,000 people with an annual payroll exceeding over one. A lot of that was based on a manufacturing economy. A manufacturing and blue collar union jobs. Right? And the, the, it was based on a wage structure that, that allowed you. Um, whether you manufacture or otherwise, but a wage structure that allowed you to aspire for greater things than, than you currently have and allow you to actually accomplish that. The idea of the social contract that if you work hard uh, and uh, you can make your way in this country, if you, if you go to work every day, you pay your taxes, you do the things you're supposed to, you can make your way. That social contract's been broken. We've not officially told everybody, oh, by the way, that social contract thing, that's no longer in effect, but it's true because so, so many folks now, this inequality of wages, Again, we're at the, you know, some of the highest peaks of inequality between the top and the bottom since right before the Great, the great, the great de Depression um, you know, in the early 1930s. And their dream became a reality. It's okay that um, we're not going to be in the 1950s like Leave it to Beaver, right? Uh, it, it's okay. We're going to have a new definition of one home as a new definition of what the American dream is, but it's still founded, I think, in some core principles about can you lead the life that, 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 that you want to lead, right? Can are developers addressing that issue? Or are they still out there building huge yeah. subdivisions for uh, Leave there, it to Beaver families? There, there's a number who went bankrupt because they tried to do too much of that, but I bet once things get going again, they're going to run right back to the model that they know. Um, by and large. There'll be a handful who will be the, the outliers and then quite frankly there'll be the trendsetters on what, what's next. Is it a smaller home? Is it, is it a more functional home? Is it closer to amenities? Is it, you know, again, we look, we know our, we know our kids' generation, um, they want to be wired, they want to be connected electronically and digitally. They, could, they care less about where their front yard and backyard is, right? They may enjoy the three drive-in theaters. Everything will always evolve and change over time, right? And that, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just the way the world will slowly evolve. It won't, it won't be quick and clearly in St. Louis, we'll be slower than most. You know, we, we, won't, we won't follow the trends immediately because that's just not what we do. 
that are built to be homes for the average American family. Your boys and girls and my boys and girls growing up into healthy and vital manhood and womanhood as the citizens of tomorrow. So let's continue this discussion about, well, this idea of the American dream and owning your own home and really what are the challenges for people to be able to do that today. Joining me is Eric Ziegel from Beyond Housing, Katrina Summers, who's a housing programs manager for St. Louis County, and Nate Johnson, who's president of Real Estate Solutions, who deals with commercial and residential real estate. Let me ask you this, first of all, in a very general sense. Um, Chris was talking about this, this social contract being broken, that, that maybe this idea of home ownership that, that I grew up with is, is changing. Do you find that to be true? No, you know, I actually don't, Jim. I think that what we've seen in our economy has been a sort of putting home ownership on pause. I think a lot of people have done that. You know, we've been through a very, very tragic economic downturn over the last several years, and we're coming out of that. And as we're coming out of that, what we're seeing is an increase in the appetite for people looking to achieve home ownership, where before they sort of took a step back and said, whoa, I don't know how to handle that. Do you guys agree with that? Is it? Uh is it just sort of we're in a lull and people are waiting for, for, for things to happen? Because I want to ask you specifically, if they want to make it happen, how do they make it happen and what are the challenges today? I think so, that, as Nate said, that there isn't a pause and um, you know, as people struggle in the, in the jobs and making sure that their incomes are stable and working on their, on their savings that may have been depleted while they were cut back in hours or, or faced a complete job loss, uh, we see a lot of folks are interested in and saying, well, I'm hearing that the, the rates are good, now's a good time to own. Uh, can I own the same for, for renting? Some of this, those are the, the, the questions that we're getting at our organization. And I think, yeah, the, the, you can do it. We provide you know, the education and the tools to make sure that first time buyers are doing it right. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a specific demographic, though, that's buying right now. Uh, what we see in our programs, and I'm looking at this through a lens of affordable housing, not necessarily um, across the region, but um, they're mostly um, single um, female head of household uh, mothers. So that's mostly what we're seeing. I think as we shift towards more of the millennials, we are going to see more of a change. But uh, right now, it, it is pretty steady. But again, it is that main demographic that we're that's, um, that they're buying our homes right now. I know a lot of people got into trouble with the mortgages and the foreclosures and all of that. Uh, how do they are, they, are they more aware coming into this that they need to stay out of trouble or is there still a lot of education? Is there still a lot of maybe misunderstanding about just how tough and the commitment that this, this is going to be? I, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, uh, we see that too in telling that the, the main issue is well, the, they've, hear, they've heard in the news too about the, the credit tightening and they're not so sure they can, they can do it themselves. And we say you, you can and we just make sure that, that there is, as Katrina said, the affordability factor there and we walk them through the, the complete process and to, to get them ready to pass over to a lender. This is what a lender is going to look for in your profile so that they are aware of, okay, these are all the steps. Uh, I am gonna. I am gonna need to take, and we say it's always. You always need more money than you, than you think you did, and, and generally a little more time. Yeah, I think there's definitely still needs to be some more education around what credit is. Um, sometimes I get calls from people. They're like, "Well, I was able to get a credit card at J.C. Penney, so my credit must be pretty good, right?" And that's really not the way that you should look at this. Um, so we do rely heavily on organizations like Beyond Housing and other housing counseling agencies to really give them that foundation that they're not getting elsewhere. Do, do, do people know this stuff when, they, when, when, you, when you're showing them around? Are, are, they, are, they, are they asking the right questions? Yeah. You know, uh, what we do is we sit down with our clients and counsel them. We have an hour-long presentation that we go over every step in the process because it doesn't make sense for me to get somebody in my car and start showing them homes and, you know, writing contracts. They need to understand. That's where the education part comes in. And we believe that, you know, not everybody is prepared for home ownership. And the more educated we can help our clients become, the better prepared they're going to be, and it's going to help them make good real estate decisions. What we find, what at least I find, is that most people think their credit is worse than it is. You know, we, you know, we find that people, oh, I was late on my payment. They paid it on the fifth instead of the first. 
and that's not necessarily going to impact their, their credit adversely. So when they do go and talk with the lender about financing, they go, oh yeah, I've got great credit scores, and, and they're able to move forward with that. I, I know there was a lot of talk about predatory lending and all of that, but there were also issues related to the economic downturn. A lot of people got into houses because they had two jobs or they had overtime. Then the economy crashes, they lose the second job or they lose the overtime hours. Are, are, this is sort of thing that, that you guys do over at Beyond Housing all the time, isn't it? It's sort of like you can't spend everything you're bringing in today to get into that house. Yeah, and we make sure that, well, the, the lenders have a different criteria in terms of the debt to income ratio, and they will often look at their uh, borrower's gross income. And we say that's one way of qualifying. We often say, let's look at that, that same figure, but based on the net, um, knowing that you actually have to pay your mortgage and other bills on your take home pay. And again, we really stress the affordability factor and saying your, your lender may have approved you for this amount, but that no uh, reason you have to borrow that or you know, buy that much house. And really, um, in a sense, I don't want to say tuck off the ledge, but really say this is where you are affordability wise. And knowing that, uh, for instance, we talked earlier about the student loan factor. Your, if your student loans are in deferment, the lender doesn't have to take those into account. And we really stress, like, you know, six months from now, a year from now, you're going to have a $250, $300 uh, student loan payment. And, and how does that, you have to factor that in. Yeah, that's well. got to be a big issue for this, uh, for this generation coming out of, uh, out of universities, isn't it? Yes, very much so. Yep. Because a lot of people don't cons consider student debt real debt until they start having to pay it, right? No, and it's really, a lot of will say it's the second mortgage without the home. Um, right. As we talked earlier, thirty, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars, and that's a that is a, a whole second mortgage and a savings too of, of you know paying another three hundred dollars for the next um, you know twenty, thirty years. Let me let me talk very very briefly ab about the recovery. I know in some areas. Uh, some of the things I've said, well, I think we'll talk about this uh, uh, later as well, that the higher priced homes have recovered faster than the lower priced homes. And I know when I talked to Chris Kramer, he said a lot of those lower priced homes ain't never coming back to where they were. So how many people are sort of stuck in the remnants or, or, or stuck with the, the, the reality of what happened during the mortgage crisis? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, a, it's a struggle because often in some of our communities, you know, there's other factors that are playing a part in that. You know, you've got the uh, education system in some of our communities that, are, that is failing, and as a result, that is significantly impacting housing values because what happens is you have people who are in a, who are in a position to moving out of these communities into other communities with better schools, and as a result, they're leaving behind what's left and the housing values suffer you know you've got a vacant home it's subject to vandalism all sorts of things and in a lot of our entering suburbs um, and we we do have some functionally obsolescent homes just with the way that they were designed they're just not really meeting up with what today's consumer is looking for so that creates additional challenge over and above you know what, what's already there right so not a single issue for for the entire metropolitan area but it really goes neighborhood right. to neighborhood mm -hmm. thanks for joining us join the conversation stay tuned STL we're gonna be right back As we said, this real estate recovery is a neighborhood to neighborhood situation. It's also uh, varies city to city and region to region. So joining us on Google Hangout from Arlington, Virginia is Daniel Hale, who's with the National Association of Realtors. Uh, Daniel, thanks for joining us. And I wanted to ask you, well, let's take this, this national view first before we start breaking it down. 
how good, how healthy is this housing market recovery, real estate recovery in the United States? Well, some of your earlier guests talked about some of the statistics. Um, I think the key thing to remember is that 2012 was a record year of housing affordability, um, but 2013 was a record year of price recovery. So in most areas across the country and um, in the nation as a whole, prices were up about 10 percent nationwide in 2013. What are, the, what are the really prominent trends? Can you kind of break that down so we, we know kind of what we might be looking at? Sure. So in 2013, we had a huge bounce back in sales and in prices. Um, towards the end of the year, uh, that was largely due, um, we, we saw that in the early part of the year, the spring and the summer, the peak home buying season. Towards the end of the year, we saw that taper off just a little bit because we saw a really substantial rise in mortgage rates in the late spring um, that eventually impacted home sales going into the fall and into the early part of the year. In the last couple months in the housing market, we've seen slowing sales, uh, some slowing in contract signing. It's a little bit early to see how long that slowing will persist as people adjust to the new normal level for mortgage rates but we expect that the spring will give us a much better indicator of what the 2014 home selling season will look like. Yeah, there was a study that, that uh, came out yesterday, I think, that said overall we could look at medium home price, median home prices recovering to 2006 levels by 2018, another five years. They put St. Louis in one of the categories of one of the more uh, quickly recovering cities. Does that make sense to you, that, that kind of five-year outlook? That sounds about right. Of course, some areas are fully recovered now. We do a quarterly metro price release where we look at roughly 150, 160 metros across the country. And what we saw is that about 30% of them were fully recovered as of the fourth quarter of 2013. So in some areas, there's already been substantial price recovery. We, we've heard about certain cities that Las Vegas comes to mind as being incredibly hard hit. Uh, by the, the bursting of the housing bu bubble. Are there cities where these recoveries will be much, much uh, more difficult and painful and longer? Well, sure. In a lot of those cities where you had a crisis that was housing related, you saw a substantial fall in house prices, this is substantial drop off in construction, you've started to see the housing market rebound. So Las Vegas is a great example, and other cities in the West and California have really led as far as price growth is concerned in the last year. They've seen substantial rebounds in prices, some 20% or more. Now, of course, the people started to worry, are we seeing another housing bubble? Uh, the answer is probably not, because even though they've recovered 20% or more, they're recovering from such low levels that they're still not above the prices that they saw in the peaks of the market in 2005, 2006. So, there's, there's a little bit of room for optimism there in the sense that they're not quite back to where they were, although for people who bought at that time period, um, that still means there's still some price recovery that's needed before they're completely restored. Are, are there trends that you see particularly among, as I look at the, the, the next generation or the next two generations of home buyers, a shift in what they're looking for, um, shifts in trends of, of, of what they want, because we, we, we talked about the, the white picket fence in the suburbs. Do you get a sense that uh, around the country that's really an old-fashioned idea at this point? So I'm not the expert on the structure of homes uh, that people are, are wanting, but we do see when we do surveys that home ownership is still a major part of the American dream. Um, we do have some surveys that look at these questions. One of the interesting things that I know from our most recent survey, we've asked about a lot of multi-generational homes, and we found that um, a significant number of buyers are looking for multi-generational homes, either because they What do you mean are, exactly by multi-generational home? Does that mean my kids uh, move, uh, taking over my house and well, giving me a place kids, in the basement? <laughs> right, either because your kids move back in with you, um, or because you know your, your parents are moving in with you. So, um, the multi-generational definition is a little bit broad, but people are looking at um, different types of family arrangements that not just mom, dad, and kids. Great. Daniel Hale from the National Association of Realtors, Arlington, Virginia. Thanks for uh, giving us the time and your expertise on this national picture. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks. So, now, now, let's, let's,
We've got something to say. Bill, Would this you is, mind? Well, we're on. And so Bill Emmons from the Federal Reserve Bank. This is the guy we always go to for the numbers. So I'm not sure if I'm going to get lost in your numbers. But go ahead and re re react, respond to uh, what you've been hearing at this point. All very good uh, analysis. I think it is very uneven across the country. It's uneven within our own area. Uh, pockets of strength, I think I've heard people talk about. In general, the Missouri side's a little stronger than the Illinois side. The US 40 corridor is strong. Still weakness in some parts of North City, North County. Um, and throughout the whole cycle, we've had less up, less down. So we didn't, we weren't hit as hard as some cities. Um, we, we never seem to be, you know, at the top or the bottom, right. the best or the worst, the fastest or the slowest. Right. Would, would, would that fit in with this in, entire, um, both economic and, and, and real estate uh, decline and, and recovery? Absolutely, right. We're, we're not, not on the extremes at all. So a couple of these issues that were brought up, and, and let's talk about the differing areas. There are certain, are, are, we talked about certain cities, let's say Las Vegas, yes. that has a long recovery and right. if, if, it, if that happens, and it probably will. Are we dealing with communities that in, in, in here, and North County comes to mind because mm -hmm. we've talked about that a number of times, uh, older housing stock, um, right. uh, declining population, lots of foreclosures. How difficult is the outlook for certain areas that have um, that sort of density of problems or, or, or depth of problems? I think it is, it is a serious uh, concern, and I think uh, Chris said it. We have evolved, we continue to evolve, and uh, some, uh, you know, some communities are going to do better than others, and uh, yeah, there's no question that there are, there are areas that are, that are not going to get back to where they were. So what, sh what should we be looking for? Um, say in the next five or 10 years? What, what are the indicators that, that, that you really keep track of that, you know, some of us are looking at the mm -hmm. number of for sale signs, right. or what the prices are, what the interest rates are. Right. There's gotta be a lot more to this than that, right? Okay, well let me, let me say a little bit about the home ownership rate. Uh, my colleague Brian Noeth and I are doing a lot of work on home ownership rates, looking uh, at different groups in the population. So first of all, the overall home ownership rate for 2013, the numbers just came in, uh, just over 65 percent. That's the ninth consecutive decline after uh, peaking. That followed about 10 years of an increase. And so it could be that we had about 10 years uh, moving up the homeownership rate and about 10 years moving it down. And we're going to maybe end up about where we started, about 64 uh, percent. It's not clear if we've stopped declining. But underneath that uh, overall number, uh, the homeownership rate among younger families has fallen much more sharply. It's down from 50 to 42 percent in the families under 40. Down also in the middle-aged uh, range, 40 to 61. It's actually up a little bit for older families. So uh, I think that probably means that we're going to have, since the younger families now have lower homeownership rates than they did, that that will persist over time. And so we'll have, uh, as I say, probably a, a lower homeownership rate than at the, the peak of a few years ago. Okay, stay, stay with us. We're going to be, uh, have a bigger discussion at the next yes. table, but we wanted to take a look at uh, one person who is uh, living through a lot of the things that, uh, that we've been talking about the last few years. My name is Nadia Lanter. I have been working with the Historic Tax Credit Program since 2007. Basically, I work with developers who take old historic buildings and turn them into something really cool. I got married in 2005 and divorced in 2008. Um, and no sooner we are in the mortgage crisis. And, um, you know, my ex-husband was gone and I had my house. I was left with the mortgage payments and, um, and a, and a two-year-old daughter at the time and trying to maintain that was very challenging. Go for a walk. You know, when you have a mortgage, you've when you own, when you're working towards owning your home, you're you're succeeding. You, you are you are um, you have an asset. You have something that you can call yours. I tried really hard to stay in my house, and I wanted to work with a bank to try to get um, some kind of to reach some kind of um, 
middle ground so that I could so that I could continue to stay in my home. And I remember calling the bank. They said, well, in order for you to apply for this program, you have to default on your mortgage payments for at least three months. So I said, you're telling me you don't want me to make my mortgage payments for three months. And I'm talking to attorneys, bankruptcy attorneys, real estate people about how do I how do I sustain this and without losing my home? Um, and nobody could really give me an answer. I remember I came home from work one day and I got home and there was two FedEx packages that were sitting on my front porch. One was from the home loan modification program giving me new terms. The other was a foreclosure notice, both from the same bank. And once that, ha I mean, what are you gonna do? I wound up filing for bankruptcy and my house went into foreclosure. The fact that my mom worked as hard as she did to have a home and provide for me, then I wind up losing it because of this whole issue. I, it was it was harrowing, absolutely harrowing. Now I'm I'm out from underneath that. Um, we're rent, I'm renting. Um, so I moved in here in 2010, and this place has been perfect just for for me and my daughter because it it was there's two bedrooms and you know it's a little townhome and it's been great. As we've grown, we've gotten more and more things, and we, I always say we need more space just because my daughter has so many American Girl dolls. I wound up meeting my husband when my daughter was in kindergarten. He, he's an attorney and he works in Belleville, Illinois, and we live here in Chesterfield, so I always say he loves me very much because he drives every day, 50 minutes from Chesterfield to Belleville and back. <laughs> so that is... That's hard, that's a tough commute. And so we are trying to find something that's a little bit more middle ground. So this one has four bedrooms, uh, two and a half baths, and it's uh, listed at 325. I love this. You know, in order for us to buy a home, it's gonna have to be just on his name. If I'm on the loan, it jacks his interest rates way up. It's, I, I still feel like I, yeah. I'm suffering yeah, PTSD a... from what I went through. I mean, the, the emotional part of it is kind of rubbed off, but those financial scars are there and they're going to be there forever. Uh, so we're, we've, we've looked in the Shaw neighborhood, we've looked in Tower Grove. It would be really nice if I could walk down the street to a vibrant coffee shop. You know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't feel right about Only good neighbors. not at least trying really again neat. and hoping that, you know, this was a blurp in the radar and um, I have to work on trying to reestablish myself and, and um, give myself a second chance. So that's a story of loss and recovery. I have a feeling there's a number of stories of people who have lost and haven't been able to recover. Bill Emmons from the Federal Reserve uh, still with us. Eric Madkins, who deals with uh, housing mortgage foreclosure issues at the Urban League. And Derek Thomas, who is a uh, developer with the Urban Build Group, also chairs Affordable Housing Commission, and is on the board of the St. Louis Home Builders Association. Let's talk about this idea of, of how many people are still out there trying to recover from what they've gone through. Let's not even talk about getting into their first house, but, mm -hmm. but uh, how, the effects still being felt of, of, of that, that housing dive Yes, we're still seeing the uh, the effects of the, um, of the of the housing uh, bubble, at least of the um, of the financial housing uh, crisis, because um, the problems still exist uh, for the most part. And, and I know on our end at the Urban League of Metropolitan St. Louis, uh, we work with a lot of uh, existing homeowners, and really our um, our main objective or our main goal is to make sure that we can stabilize uh, the homeowners. And then a lot of times there may be a, a loss of income that's suffered in that household. It could be a situation where you know it could, I'm just going to use an example. A spouse may have um, had to, you know, may have been downsized, where the income may not have been at the um, the same apex that it may have been when they originally purchased. So, really, our main objective is to prevent, it, uh, actually, not to prevent, but to actually present as many uh, options as possible and to show them options as far as loan modification. If they do not want to remain in the property, we can look at a short sale or deed and lose. So the main thing is to be able to show them as many options as possible and then even for homeowners who want to remain in their home, look for ways to, I would say, right size the mortgage and make it more affordable so they can sustain the dream of home ownership. Derek, as a developer, how do you look at, at, at what needs to be done 
to to address the the housing issues in the next you know a couple of years, five years, ten years. Well, that's a <clears throat> a, a pretty interesting question. Um, uh, as a builder and developer, and working with the Home Builders Association, uh, there's a lot of builders who deal with different types of products, and <clears throat> and we haven't seen uh, a whole lot of movement in one category or the other. The uh, the market that I specialize in, in in the city is pretty much a patch, <coughs> excuse me a patch quilt work of um, uh, of dealing and so um, it's a challenge that we we struggle with. Are, are people looking for innovative ways? When we when we we talked to Chris Kramer in the in the earlier package, you know he was saying people need to be looking at uh, uh, building for these new demands. But he said but once the recovery starts, they'll be going out and building the suburban developments again and maybe maybe missing where that demand is. Do you, do you agree with that? I definitely agree with that. Um, uh, the, the urban builders have kind of put the brakes on um, building the product that we used to build. Um, I think that the market is going to change substantially over the next two or three years in terms of what, it, what the market really wants. And, and uh, I think the focus is probably going to be more on the millennial clientele as opposed to a, a broad segment and you know frankly we don't know really what to build we don't have the the uh, challenges we have the challenges of bank financing and we can't spec build like we used to and, yeah. and that's pretty much um, what happens in the city you got to kind of build it and they come so to speak and Bill I see you shaking your head there yeah <laughs> as you said we, we don't know what to build and I think we don't know how strong the recovery will be. We don't know what incomes are going to do. We probably do know that we're going to have a slow growing population, even slower than we had before, and we know that we're going to have an aging population. So the just the, the group of people who are looking for, for a house is different than it was five or ten years ago. Is the, you know, I'm fascinated by this, I've heard of this from a couple of people. Single parent families looking for, for homes. Young single people as a market not mm -hmm. just new married couples who are going to have with their first kid or planning to have a family, but single maybe professionals who've got the money. It's a good market to buy, right? Mm -hmm. is, are these are these some of the trends that you see going on? Sure, they are. Well, that's two different things: young yeah. professional buying a house for him or herself and a single parent family trying to find a house. But yeah, from a new construction standpoint, uh, there is some traction in that market in the city. I've seen um, a number of. Uh, young couples, young married couples, in fact, uh, purchasing homes in the city. The question is always, you know, the lessons we learned. We often forget the uh, the lessons we're supposed to have learned, or the lessons I've learned. My kids don't know, or my <laughs> lessons my parents learned. I certainly didn't apply. Um, but do we have this? I want to go back to this idea that people are a little gun shy, maybe, yes. about getting into this because of the problems they've heard. Absolutely, and I think uh, you see it with young people and people who've had had a problem, who uh, maybe got into something that was more than they uh, than they could could handle because of job loss or uh, something like that. So yeah, it does seem that there's much more caution in the market. Yeah, I think the question is, I mean, it used to be everybody wanted a home. Um, was was told they needed to have a home, they should have a home. I'm not sure everybody feels that way anymore. But I also think, though, too, that um, I know with the subprime bubble that, that, that took place, um, like in the early 2000s, I think that the market has, you know, shown its way to, you know, to show more, I would say, more reputable uh, type products. I mean, more A-type paper on type loans. And um, actually, these loans will actually mean more success for the homeowner, you know, in the, in the long run, or at least in the, in the short term um, as well. And those so those subprime loans originally were supposed to be to get, help people who couldn't get in get in and then it, it went off in a different direction. But are the protections now, you're saying, are the protections there maybe keeping some of those folks out? Most definitely. I think so. And there's no secondary market for subprime. And then that, that was what ultimately was driving the whole market was the ability to sell those loans to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And investors won't, won't take them now. So it stops the whole process. We, and we get into a bigger housing question. Okay, so you can't buy, you can't afford to buy, you're blocked out. But is the rental property available where people can, can you know, is that a separate issue altogether? I mean, if we can't buy, we need rental property, right? Mm -hmm. How big of a problem is that? 
Um, I don't think that's particularly a big pro problem, especially in the city. That's primarily what's been uh, fueling the, the demand for housing in the city. Um, the statistics show that uh, there's been an increase in renovations and turnover in that type of property and the folks who could no longer purchase have gone into higher quality rentals because the investors have stepped in to fill that void. Yeah. And the rise of the single family rental is, is pretty important. Right, right. Okay guys, stick around, uh, get in the conversation, hashtag stay tuned, STL. We're gonna continue this discussion in a bit. So back to, I think, some of the broader issues and the issue that we love on Stay Tuned about, about communities joining us at the table. Andy Thizing from the Institute for Urban Research at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Barbara Belasi is a realtor with the Belasi team. And Jim Gallagher back uh, to join us from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. You know, I wanted to say we, we made references in, in the piece earlier about the Leave it to Beaver lifestyle. And I had to ask some of the younger people if they knew what we were talking about. <laughs> But I tell you, Leave it to Beaver still resonates as, as a reference point for 1950s America. But let's talk about this, this, this idea of people getting in the first time, young homeowners. Is that something that um, you guys are, 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 are seeing or hearing about or your students are talking about or what? Well, I wonder if we haven't scared our young people to death about homeownership. You know, they, they realize that if I bought in 06, I would be underwater, I would have my student loan, I couldn't get out, I'd be stuck. I'd be stuck in St. Louis, I couldn't sell my house. And, and maybe that, so much of, of their adult life so far has been taken up by recession and a housing crash mm -hmm. that, that perhaps they've decided, you know, maybe I don't want to buy a house. What do you think? But look at the realities that, that graduating students are, are facing. Um, Ten years of student loan repayment, that's something a previous generation really didn't have right. to deal with at the same. Um, they're not going to have that, that one employer for 30 years. They're not going to have the pension programs that previous generations had. Are they going to want to put their wealth into property and real estate like the previous generations did? Mm -hmm. Barbara, are they? I, hope, I think you hope they are, right? Well, I, I find that they, they do, but what we're seeing is that the, the average age of the first time home buyer is, is in the early 30s now versus mid 20s like it used to be. So the National Association of Realtors says that the average age of the first time buyer is 33. So what we're seeing is people are waiting, they're getting their careers established, they're getting married, they're starting to raise a family, and then they're deciding to buy a home. You know, the student debt issue that you raised is, is very serious. There was a study, I believe it was a Federal Reserve study, that indicated that all through you know, the past decades, a college graduate, young college graduates, was more likely to own a house than a high school graduate. But that has now reversed. And, and maybe the, the student debt burden is, is a bigger factor than we think it is. Well, let me talk big picture historically, and, and Andy, you can help me with this, because Chris brought it up uh, in, in the piece I did with the St. Anne's story, the income disparity that the idea of this middle class that was built, that the picket fence in the suburban yeah. communities were built on, this, this working class middle class, to a great extent is gone, or not certainly not what it used to be. And we know from the recovery that the recovery for the nice houses, the more expensive houses is going well, the recovery for the lower priced houses not going well, may never come back. Do you see that, let's be sociologists for a minute, do you see that as a problem going ahead? I see it as a problem because 
I, th I think this is how some of these other national issues are showing up. Um, look at wage disparities and low starting wages. If we don't give people livable, livable wages, how can we expect them to be homeowners? Of course, the people with lots of resources are always going to be buying nice homes. But what about the people on the other end? They seem to be, they seem to be short shrifted every step of the way. And, and I think we're starting to see the effects of that. And, and you see also that, that for the average middle class person, much of their wealth is in the house. If they rent forever, they perhaps will never never develop that net income, that, 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 that personal wealth that they would need to take with them into retirement. Barbara, are realtors and developers going to have to be coming up with creative ways not to sell, but to get people to into that market? Yes, I think that a lot of realtors, especially in St. Louis, are very focused on um, putting our efforts towards educating the consumer. What we don't want um, in St. Louis and nationally is to um, continue to have this growth of renters and then the growth of wealth at the upper end and nothing in between. And so I think it is our, it's our responsibility as professionals in the industry to let people know that there is financing available, that there are home programs um, available so that people can uh, still purchase a home. Whether if it's in their early 30s, I think that's fine. I mean, whether the, if the age is a little bit higher, I think that's fine. But, but home ownership does correlate strongly with with overall wealth, and so we don't want to um, develop a society where we have, you know, such extreme haves and have-nots. So we need to be careful. You know, Andy, I know you've done a lot of work in the in the impoverished communities of the East Side and some of the struggling communities of the East Side. Um, I'm wondering if they've uh, kind of ahead of us, uh, and you know, in, in St. Louis County or North County on some of these issues. Uh, because of, of, of what they've had to face. Well, there are places, there certainly are pockets in, in St. Clair County, especially in, in the East St. Louis area where, where predatory lending and foreclosures, I mean, that's, that's old news there. Right. And, uh, but there are also, you know, the recovery is uneven as, as we've, we've already established. You know, places like Edwardsville, doing very well. The, the, the real estate market is, is strong. We're seeing new construction out that way. Um, you know, as we, as we get in closer to East St. Louis, it's, it's not so well. And you take a place like Granite, which is, it was, it was based on a, an, on a steel and manufacturing economy. Um, they must be facing some of the same things here. I, 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 yes, they are, and and you know, so much of that old home ownership, the American dream, was was built on having that factory job, a good union job with with wages, and those just don't exist anymore. And I wonder if the younger people who do have the good jobs and, and the money, are they more mobile than they used to be, so they don't want to tie themselves down to one city anymore? Well, I, I think that's a key. Certainly, the educated class of young people realize that they that a, a home does perhaps lock you in, and you're less mobile. And if I get that great job in Silicon Valley, I want to up and take it before it goes away. So I think that might be part of it. But then if you marry a St. Louis girl, she's going to make you move back to St. <laughs> Louis and buy a house, right? That I mean, really, happen. that yes. does happen, right? Yes. I mean, it is good. I, I, I would think, and, and I have this idea that maybe, maybe things are shifting and all of that, but, but Barbara, I, I would guess that you're finding young people who are looking for the same things that young couples and families were looking for, you know, for, for quite some time. I would agree with you very much, especially when they decide to have children and then schools become important, and then even if they're going to live in a home for five or six years and move from one neighborhood to another or move out of state, they're still buying and selling and in moving either state to state or neighborhood to neighborhood. So um, we do still see that. I think what we just, we're at a critical time right now where we are recovering and we need to educate the consumer to let them know that there, there are programs in place and that they can get into the market. I mean, this is just such a critical factor, the, 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 the housing market in a community. If it's bad, population is going down, which makes it worse. In areas that are growing, things are doing well. I mean, the, these things have to be all tied in together, Andy, as you look at these different communities. We can't just separate out, you know, the housing market. There's cause and effect and back to cause and back to effect. Well, I was thinking, when, when Barbara was speaking, I was thinking about stability and that there are a lot of people who move out, but they're moving out by choice. But think of the population that moves out because they're forced to, because they've lost a job, not because they have a new opportunity, but they've lost a job or, or there's some catastrophic illness or, or you know, the, the, something's happened to the home and they were uninsured. You know, there, it, it's, it's that stability that gets undermined yes. and that can destroy a neighborhood very quickly. Do you see a sense, and we've had this discussion a couple weeks ago when you were here, about um, people looking for different things. We talked about diversity, connectivity, good public transportation. 
Um, that's a suggestion. I'm not sure that that sprawl is reversed or at an end. But Barbara, do you see both of those things going on? People are still buying homes further and further out and building homes further and further out. Do you see also growth in some of those those other areas? And maybe it is a reversal. I don't know. Uh, absolutely. Actually, in the past couple of years, I've helped um, you know several families move in. Uh, you know, gas prices going up and the jobs being sort of centered around. Um, our downtown and, and Clayton area, you see people moving in. So I think it'll be interesting to see as, as new, new builds begin again, as new construction starts, to see are, are people going to move back west? Will are, it be as robust as it was? Are these largely older folks uh, no. downsizing? No, no, these are, these are young families with, with children who are moving in for our schools. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So everybody else, we've asked everybody else to come back in, so go at it, guys. Let me, let me throw out this idea of uh, these these trends which we have talked about on this show about uh, older older communities closer communities more connected communities is that something people just like to talk about or is that a real thing that that's happening are we have we reached the limit of the uh, I'll use the word sprawl I know people don't like it but have we reached the limit of going further and further out well uh I'm seeing a lot of folks that are looking to move back in the urban core. You know, we're seeing quite a bit of that. People are looking for more walkable communities, increased levels of density. They are looking at their lifestyle in general as opposed to just the house. People don't want to drive an hour uh, commute every day for their for their jobs anymore. Yeah, but they that want a three bedroom, two hundred twenty-five thousand dollar house with a good school district is pretty attractive. Schools are always a challenge. I think they nailed it gasoline prices that's the answer to whether or not we're going to have sprawl if gas is cheap we're going to sprawl if gas is expensive we're not well, on the other hand you have a trend of the jobs moving out closer to where the educated people are so yeah but there's also a trend in jobs moving where the millennials want to be and that's going to be more in urban core areas so a lot of the high paying jobs are moving from the suburbs back downtown in areas and what core means has changed. So there's the corridors, now the core, maybe, instead of the old central business district. So the core now it includes Clayton and... Uh, right, yeah, the, the, the US 40 corridor, yeah. I think, is the core of the region. And, and if you look at some of the folks that are sort of in charge of some of the housing decisions, if we look at home builders and things like that, it's easier to build out further. You know, it's a, there's a lot fewer impediments to build out in St. Charles County than there is to work on an infill development within the city of St. Louis or within one of these entering suburbs or, uh, you know, all, in other parts of St. Louis. It's just much more difficult. And the profit margins may be a little less because you're building fewer homes at a time as opposed to a huge track development. I mean, we talk about, you know, one of the big trends in, in St. Louis, well, not big trends, but one of the big developments in St. Louis was, was the, the lofts and all of that. So that's ownership to a great extent. Not all of them, but that's ownership. It's a different kind of ownership than people were talking about 20 years ago. And, and I just wonder if maybe we were talking about the single family home with a white picket fence. Um, what about other trends in, in, in condominiums, co-ops, lofts? those sorts of things or is that just something that makes a good story but it's not it's just a little blip on the radar I think we're seeing a lot of empty nesters moving into more urban environments either moving into the central west end or downtown and enjoying sort of this new lifestyle where they're not taking care of a yard and that kind of thing that might have been what you were referring to or when you were asking you know who's moving in so that's definitely something that I'm seeing in my business well, I mean, the, the idea of, you know, after you've owned a home for a while, the idea, you, you didn't really know what you were getting into. Mm -hmm. When it came to the maintenance, the property taxes, and y y you wonder, wouldn't I be better off, you know, going and having a cup of coffee mm -hmm. than, than replastering, you know, the ceiling or something like that. So, and I just wonder if, if, if the people with, with a lot of time and work hard aren't just looking for, a, a lower impact, you know, uh, 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 and fewer responsibilities in where they live. And again, I, you know, Bill, I think about these things, and they make good stories for TV and for the for the newspaper about trends and Time Magazine cover. But is it really significant, or is what is driving this still the single family home? 
Yeah, and I was going to say and, and ask others to, to weigh in on it, too. You hear these stories about really where builders want to be is at the upper end of the market, whether it's a single-family home or multifamily. They want to sell the expensive houses. And so, so like you know, selling it's the chronic... more expensive cars, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. They're not going to make as much money on a, on a more affordable house, whether it's single-family or multifamily. And I don't know if that's still the case or if there's any way to, to break that pattern. I mean, it, it, builders are in business to make money, and if you make more money building more expensive homes, that's where they're going to build. But if the market for those expensive homes is not there, if people decide that I do want a more urban lifestyle, I do think that the builders would respond to that. And perhaps they are. Perhaps we're seeing some of that. Uh, uh, Bill's right in, in that respect. It's, it's very difficult, uh, especially in uh, the urban core, to build a product uh, under $200,000 unless there's some subsidy in it. <clears throat> and typically you have to be building um, several of them at a time or, or, or staggered in order to have the economies of scale to do that. What kinds of things, you mentioned subsidies, what, what kinds of things or programs are needed to drive this and meet the needs, not just to the people who want to move up to a you know bigger and bigger house, but the needs of people who need to get into a house and would like to have it. Are the programs there? Do we need... Uh, do we I've need more? And, uh, we're excited for, in our work at Beyond Housing for finally the city of St. Louis has offered down payment assistance and they haven't previously till 2009 was the last time they did. And that's really bringing a lot of folks to the table. I've heard you have city funds and city funds are available. And those kinds of things, uh, you know, really do help, especially as we talked about the millennials wanting to move back in a little bit in single family homes. And uh, we hope that it continues because, um, our, you know, our, our market's really, um, you know, our phone's ringing for, for city purchases. Yeah, let, let me go back for a minute for, for this first time home buyer. Um, what kind of a down payment do you need? And, and again, in previous generations, people saved lots of money or they borrowed from their parents and a lot of those parents are like me and I'm saying, I, I don't have it, right? Yeah. I don't have it. Um, what kind of down payment, what do you need going into a house, you know? What, what, what do you need in the bank? What do I need to put on the table to get that house? Well, for an FHA loan, 3.5% uh, for your down payment, you can get a conventional loan with 5% down. Um, so we don't see 100% financing products out there on the market anymore, but it's still just, you know, 35 to 5% to get into a home. That is a little nerve-wracking because, um, you know, that there's not a whole lot holding them to that property. But uh, that's, that's just the way the loans are structured right now. That was one of the biggest risk factors in defaults and foreclosures, I think. Isn't that right? That if the, the lower the down payment, those were more often people who had problems. Absolutely, because in that instance, you know, the, um, the lender, at least the investor in that situation, has to assume more of that risk. So really, what they're looking for nowadays is for the, um, you know, for that potential prospective uh, homeowner to at least come, um, you know, with some skin in the game to have, you know, to show, to take on, to at least take on some of that risk, at least in, um, in the purchase process. Well, and I, but I would argue that, you know, the investment, the down payment investment isn't necessarily going to determine whether someone's going to be a successful homeowner, because if you look at the VA loan, which has a 0% down payment requirement, it's one of the more successful loans and has one of the lower default rates, you know, when you look across all, all product types. So, you know, when people talk about do we need to go back to 20% down versus what we enjoy today, 5%, 3.5% on the FHA loan, what that, you know, what we've got to look at are are people credit qualified? Do they have stable employment? These are the factors that are going to determine if someone's going to be a successful homeowner, not exclusively the amount that they're putting down on the home. Yeah, that's really the question, I guess. Biggest mistakes that people have made are the biggest, most common reasons that people uh, can't make their payments and, and, and default. Yeah, I don't agree. And just as Nate said, we talked about it earlier, the student loans, and we saw some of the, the tweets while we were on break, concerned about that part, and I don't want to scare first-time buyers or folks being in the market. You may have student loan debt, and that's, you just, the, the key is buying within your budget, right? And even if the, the rate uh, was still low or they didn't have enough of a down payment, so you do the affordability factor. St. Louis is, has extremely affordable housing, whether you want to be in the city, in an older home, in an older brick building, or versus out in the county, you can still purchase your home with student loan debts is just the key, the affordability factor. And yeah, and yeah, and I, I kind of forgot about that in this whole discussion that from a national standpoint, this is a pretty good place to move to yeah, and buy a house. So and I want to make the point that's very important for the region as a whole in attracting and retaining jobs. One of the things that economists have found that the, the really the most important thing explaining why the Sun Belt has boomed is low-cost housing. 
and to the extent that we can make our or keep our region affordable, that's going to be a very big advantage for us. Okay. Yeah. I, I wonder, you know, I, I look at these, I always look at these things from my own point of view, and there's a certain generation of my parents who they saved. Now, I'm not, not everybody from that generation saved, but they saved more than, than we do. But they also had low-cost gas, yes. right? I mean, cheap gas, uh, GI Bill, and then you grow up in that and you think, well, I'm going to get that too, right? I, I should just step right into that. I wonder if you get that sense that you got to tell people, don't look at that house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just because that's the house you grew up in. You got to look at this house. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is a tough conversation sometimes to help people understand what they can afford and, and, and help them you know, be comfortable with what they can afford. So that's part of the process. Absolutely. And I think it also speaks just to, uh, to home buyer education, um, just, to, just to, um, the prerequisites of actually enduring and actually going through that process. It's learning how to make the other uh, household budget, knowing you know when you're overextended and knowing if you have a deficit versus a surplus. So it's actually managing the, uh, the household and home buyer education. I would definitely advocate that. Yeah, absolutely, and a lot of people are first-generation homeowners, and that makes a huge difference, yeah. a huge difference because they don't have the experience that others may have had with uh, home ownership. You know, they weren't living in a home growing up where the parents, their parents owned that home. So it was a completely different education process for them um, to be that first-generation homeowner, and, and that does require, I believe, a tremendous amount of education to really understand what that means, and so that everyone's taking that seriously. Yeah. It would be interesting if there was some kind. Well, we don't want to, you know, add any laws. But if there was some kind of process where people learned how. I mean, I guess that's what you do at Beyond Housing. You're educating the consumer, and that's what I do as a realtor. But I, one of the reasons that I take my profession so seriously is because the first home that my husband and I bought together wasn't a great experience, and we didn't know what we were doing, and we didn't have that conversation with with our professional. Yeah. So, how many pieces of paper do you sign when you buy a house? So many. <laughs> I mean, so many. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You just hope. Right. <laughs> you haven't signed away your first child or something. Right. right? It would be interesting to, to just continue to flesh out that conversation of yeah. what we could do for, you know, St. Louis as a whole. How can we educate our, our, our consumer? Our I think the buyer. financial literacy issue is huge mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of, again, when you look generationally, the, the, the acceptance of credit cards as being sources of money as opposed to sources of credit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there is and a trend moving that way. Jim, just uh, FHA is considering either uh, for all their loans a home buyer education, or more importantly, too, as uh, Eric mentioned, too, to sit down one on one with that borrower first and do the home ownership advising. Nationally, it's looked at much lower rates for first time home buyers that come through a comprehensive program through the through the various counties and they have a one on one conversation with a HUD uh, mm -hmm. counselor and an advisor and just to really do those things that they may not have done in terms of looking over the affordability, the spending plan, uh, the student loans, the credit cards and yeah. they are it's they're considering it seeing home ownership advising at least for this one segment. But of course I, I think education might have for everyone. For everyone, oh. yeah, it would be yeah. key. And I think frankly, you know, the multi generational home's not such a bad thing. I've got a I've got a daughter and a grandson living with me and and uh, that's kind of a traditional way of doing things for various reasons. So I think there's an awful lot of, of uh, you know, changes and trends that, that come back in, because they make sense, because they're coming back. But I want to thank you guys. We've been actually on the, net, the Internet for the last few minutes talking about this. So thanks for coming in. I think it was a good topic. I think uh, You're welcome. Thank it's you. a good thank discussion. You. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks.